Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you're having yet another marvelous Monday. Once again, we have our special guest, Ryan Poole from all the way in Dayton, Ohio, joining us today. Ryan, why don't you give us a quick hello here? How's it going, guys? Ryan is a little bit of an interesting case if you missed the last one, in that he currently works in a broadcast environment where he's doing a lot of like technical director and he's leading his own crew uh, to do some live broadcast stuff but he's also doing streaming on the side for his own personal home setup so he's a little bit of a uh, entertainer host and a technical director at the same time ryan why don't you give us a, a very quick blurb about both of those and kind of a little overarching view of what these both are about so uh, live production, as we were talking about earlier, is a very stressful environment. Uh, and for streaming like, video games, the video game is the stressful part and the streaming is just the fun part. I mean, both is fun in, in general. I really love the, the kind of stressful moments you get from a, a live production broadcast. Uh, but, you know, doing video games and streaming, it, it can get a little stressful too and, you know, you just you just love that little passion of of always being live so the topic that i kind of really want to touch on for this video is how your two roles here influence each other do you think that you take home some of your work from live broadcast and incorporate those elements into your live production from home i would definitely say yeah i i definitely incorporate a lot of the like production knowledge and kind of skills and, and graphic type styles that I would do in a, in a normal broadcast and then try to incorporate those in my streams. Uh, like a lot of people don't have like scene transitions. I'm still working on a few different scene transitions uh, for like my, my gaming broadcast and I control them all on my stream deck, which it basically mimics like a switcher would in a live production, which is very nice because I can just kind of look over here. Or actually, I don't even have to look over. I can just press it and it would change my scene automatically for me. So. It's just something you kind of get used to with your, your, your normal life. You just start incorporating different things. Like I'm going to be working on a new stream intro and being able to incorporate that into the uh, the streaming content and and various things you would have in a, uh, a, a normal broadcast. One thing that I'm working on right now for my gaming stream is something that I haven't seen at all in anyone else's streams is a lower third that will appear and disappear when you go to your full camera, if I select it. So something, you know, that would normally you would see in a broadcast, you would see it and you wouldn't think of it. But when you see it in like a, a gaming live stream, you're just like, oh, that's something different. I'm, maybe I'll try that. And so it's just bringing the, the broadcast knowledge into a gaming and streaming content environment, which a lot of people are knowledgeable in, but not as knowledgeable in broadcast, you know, you can blend the two together and, and make a, a pretty solid stream. Definitely. I mean, that's got to give you kind of a leg up over the competition. Just having all this experience behind you that you can incorporate into your production. Now, what I'm kind of curious about is, does this work in reverse? Have you learned anything from your at-home streaming experience that you've been able to incorporate into your professional broadcast? So... I actually have, yes. So one of the main things, and actually I got asked this today, is how does OBS project work? And that is, that used to be the main program I use. I actually use Streamlabs OBS now, but OBS project I still use for some work stuff related. When we have board meetings and I have to stream that to YouTube from home, I use this OBS project. That way I don't have everything getting mixed up and I can have it all just set up properly. But, uh, being able to bring that knowledge of OBS project and being able to transfer that to work and share like, hey, this is how you can actually set up an interpreter inside your guys' Google Meet classrooms. So that was a project I did uh, for the school district was interpreters for COVID had like no way of being able to do ASL to students. Uh, there were there was so many complications where like the student would either be, have the, the interpreter full screen and wouldn't be able to see what the teacher was writing or doing. And I was able to compromise and include both of those into one platform. So that way these students could be able to not only watch the teacher and see what they're doing and talking about and or drawing and be able to see their interpreter at the same time. Um, as far as into live broadcast, uh, definitely it's, it's, it's harder to pinpoint exactly what uh, kind of transfers over from my gaming and streaming career 
to over to broadcast, but I, I definitely say I would be pulling some inspiration from from both sides and going back and forth on both. So maybe it's kind of like a non-tangential thing where it's just, it lets you relax more because you're more accustomed to it. You just have more time on it. Do you think that's true? I would say so, yeah, yeah. If you're always live and constantly doing it, the less the stress gets, you just kind of get used to it and you get into your own flow and, and you're able to to perform a lot bit better, I'd say. So something else that I kind of want to pick your brain about is this transition that we've seen from full scale professional broadcast with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars worth of equipment to these smaller home setups. Do you think that there's any particular element that contributed to this change that allowed creators to work on a smaller scale? Definitely the uh, open source programs and pe people building upon these open source programs like OBS. OBS has really broken the door for a lot of things. And then having companies like Elgato making different uh, capture card devices, the stream decks, the lightings, the green screen. And then now with uh, NVIDIA graphic cards and any other graphic cards being able to handle uh, basically chroma key without the chroma or what, not cr without the chroma but without a green screen, which is, that, that still kind of amazes me that a, a computer is able to process in real time that data and be able to crop out. Doesn't look as good as a green screen, but it, it, it does its job. And that, that's, uh, that is, is crazy, I think. Um, and it, it is crazy how cost effective uh, a small setup like this can be in comparison to a live setup not as reliable. Um, I've had my OBS crash multiple times in situations I didn't want it to crash or it overloads with those types of equipments that are boatloads of cash. They're almost fail safe. Yes, they'll have their issues. Yes, they'll crash, but it is few and far between and it's its own dedicated system. So it's not struggling to process any other data or take in any other data. It's basically its main focus is to do that one task. And it, it, that, it's great in that aspect. Um, and you're able to divvy out the different steps of a, a production with the higher end, uh, higher end broadcast than you are with a home setup. Like, yes, I could probably set up like a live book, which is our graphic interface for ESPN uh, broadcasts. I could probably set that up through OBS and I actually tried that here recently, but I had some issues rolling out, but there's a way I know there's, I can figure it out eventually, but it's just, uh, you're just not able to as easily connect everything as you would be with uh, live production, which I think is why everything costs so much because it's like, it's almost proprietary in some aspect. It's not, but it is. So we have kind of all these new competitors entering the game, bringing the price point down and allowing people like yourself to step in and kind of make their own production out of this. And I think you kind of touched on a very important aspect here, and that is the customization and the ability to fix stuff on the fly is where the money comes in and why these different production pieces cost so much. I distinctly remember being able to use patch panels and routers in order to rearrange signals as needed live during a production there's just a flawless seamless transition there's every little bit of hardware every data stream that you could imagine you had full control over it and if something broke you were able to fix it do you think that this is a uh, good kind of wrap up of what you were thinking there i would definitely yeah yeah it's a little bit harder uh on your own when you're it's your own obs project but uh Mainly a good just reset kind of fixes everything. But if it's anything more than that, you're just kind of out of the luck in comparison to any broadcast equipment. And beyond equipment, usually when you're doing a bigger scale production like this, that's going to mean having more people involved too, who are able to kind of work and fix things in the background while the show goes on. Mm -hmm. This is something that you really can't get with a little streaming setup that you're running from your home studio. So... I can't believe I haven't done this yet, but why don't you plug your channel for us real quickly? As he uh, blurps and covers my mouth. So this is my logo right here. Uh, and I go by King Rydog online with two Gs because why not? So that is uh, King, again, King Rydog 
R Y D O G G again, because why not? The why not's not in there. It's just King Ride Dog, by the way. So, you know, that's how the name came apart. Where did the name come from? What's the, uh, what's the origin story? Do you actually know this? I don't. Oh, so buckle up. So this actually came from fifth grade me. My friend's parents, mainly their dad, always called me Rye Dog, and that was their nickname for me. So it just was a normal thing. I went over to the house and like, hey, what's up, Rye Dog? I was like, hey. And then uh, they got me into RuneScape. And so fifth grade old me was like, oh, I would be this cool kid and have King in my name. And so we spent probably over an hour trying to ponder, what can I have in my name that has King in it? And we finally settled on King Rydog with two Gs, because why not? And that was literally <laughs> the explanation for that. I don't even look at it now that like King is in it. It just flows so well anymore that it's just, I'm like, uh, I don't even, I just kind of look past it as it being a part of it. It just kind of all flows for me anymore. I don't know. I like it. I like it. And I've been enjoying this so thoroughly, but I think this is a really good point to wrap up here. Before I let you go, any last closing thoughts that you have for any up and coming streamers out there, whether that be professional or small gaming setups like Twitch? I definitely would say don't look at streaming as a business in a way it is, but definitely don't be looking at it for the money. Check your analytics. Uh, that is a big thing that I always did. Check your analytics and see what games are producing the most um, uh, notification clicks, what's drawing in the most viewers, wrap the games that you plan on streaming kind of around those contents that are pulling in numbers more, if that's what you're looking for, but definitely don't sell yourself out to a game. Uh, I know a lot of people did that with Fortnite and he saw how everyone kind of really got burnt out on that game really quickly. Just play what you want to play. Your community will be built around that. People will be more inclined to be able to chat with you and you'll, you'll have better conversations and discussions in regards to that. As far as the live production, mainly you just got to get your foot in the door. Uh, I know, I don't, the jobs really, as far as I know, aren't posted much. A lot of the jobs is kind of word of mouth. So if you do happen to find a job that is posted online, if you're wanting to get into that, definitely take it. Uh, with, yeah, with everything kind of being word of mouth, it's like, oh, I know this person, they can fill in for me this day. That gets their foot in that door. And then they start talking with the boss and they start working for them whenever, you know, someone else can't make it. So it's just trying to get your foot in the door with one crew and making friends with everyone on there. That will lead your foot into the next door, which will lead you into the next door and lead you into the next door. So definitely don't burn your bridges. Keep your, uh, uh, everyone in contact and be able to uh, be in a good position to uh, work in more broadcasts and production. That all sounds great, Ryan. Thank you so much for your insight. I really appreciate you taking the time. And to the rest of you watching out there, keep chugging along, keep moving onward and upward, and we will see you all next Monday. Thanks, and see you next time. Bye.